we start into the presentation, I want to briefly ask who of you is familiar with um, accelerators, incubators, in general, like the topic? <coughs> Raise your hand. Okay, great. So we don't have to mention too much about that. And then my personal market research question would be, how many of you know Home at Home? Raise your hand. Well, some. We have to do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, starting with the presentation, um, we just want to share some of the experience we had during the past two years because as you can imagine, as you probably know, it's not easy working in a startup, with a startup and a corporate. It's been quite a ride during the last two years and we just want to highlight some of the, the insights we got on the way. So two years ago, we started, um, Sebastian and me, we were the co-founders and we were thinking about food um, apparently, uh, a lot of people thought about that because we have a lot of food services coming up right now. Um, but when we did the interviews, we came up with that insight, which you can see on the slide. 70% um, of interviews that we interviewed, um, they decide on the same day um, what to eat for dinner. So that struck us. And the reason why that struck us is during that time, there were a lot of food services based on subscription models. The thing is, they are not serving these 70% because if you're doing a subscription service, you're hungry today, you order the food box, it will arrive next week. So if you decide what to eat tonight, um, these food services, they don't make sense for you. So we were thinking, how can we turn that around to actually serve these 70%? And um, the solution we came up, obviously it iterated a lot. We were not afraid, mostly. Um, the service right now looks like that. So um, Martin described it quite well. We have these cooking bags, all the ingredients inside. There's a rec recipe, a cooking instruction inside. Um, it's very easy to cook. You only need salt and pepper at home, which you, like that's the only thing we uh, prerequisite. Um, and then the clue is how to get to that cooking bag. So um, we have these pickup stations, as you can see on the upper right. Um, it's basically a fridge, it's an intelligent fridge, it has an electronic lock, you can order our recipes, it's weekly changing recipes, you can order them online, so with our app or with our website, and then on the way home you pick it up on, like, to the closest um, pickup station. So it's very flexible, um, you can order on the same day, you can actually stand in front of the fridge, order and take the bag out 60 seconds later. Um, so. It's not a subscription-based model, but it's more suited towards the people that actually decide on the same day what to cook. If they're in the mood of cooking, they can just quickly grab um, a bag with us, go home and cook. So we want to take away all the hassle around cooking, like going to the supermarket, thinking about what to eat tonight, um, browsing, um, recipe, community um, stuff, um, queuing up. So all that hassle around that, we just want to get rid of, just offering this one bag, you go home, you cook, that's it. So the reason why we think that's, um, that's a good solution for some, um, for a specific target group is, um, and that came back to the insight we had when we did the first interviews. If you think about dinner, you usually think, or you usually decide um, among two factors. The first one is, uh, how convenient does it have to be? Like, do you have time or does it have to be fast? Are you too lazy to do something um, or are you in the mood of cooking for two to three hours? So that's the first factor. The second one is how healthy should it be? Do you go to your favorite kebab stand next door? Do you use your favorite pickup, um, um, takeaway food, uh, maybe some Asian um, stuff that you like? Or do you wanna go for a more healthy option? And we felt during that time the decision is either or, either convenient or fresh or healthy. And we thought um, that doesn't have to be the way it is. Um, maybe you can combine these two factors, having fresh and convenient food, and that's basically the idea of Home at Home. So that's quickly um, the startup that we were working during the two um, last years. Before we jump into um, the whole experience we had um, during the last two years, I briefly, um, Give Marius the microphone to introduce the Coke Accelerator. First of all, I want to thank Mia for the excellent yoga session. I'm so relaxed right now, I forgot everything that I wanted to say. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so yeah, as Fried said, um, we started 
with launching an accelerator a few years ago. And um, to be perfectly honest with you, it was deliberately called an accelerator, but we knew from day one that we wanted to be the furthest thing from an accelerator. Um, we looked around the world and studied um, corporate accelerators, and we couldn't honestly find one that was working quite well. Um, I know times have changed. There might be a few that are working now. Um, but selling that concept into our company from day one, we knew that was going to be a really big ask. Um, so what we decided to do was actually call it trick our company a little bit. We, we called it an accelerator, but again, we knew we didn't want to be an accelerator. And the fundamental difference was, in a traditional accelerator, companies go out and they look for ideas. Yeah? But with ours, we went out and looked for people. Um, we wanted to work with the best and the brightest people. And so we spent an incredible amount of time finding the right people that we wanted to work with and then presenting them with a, what we call a billion-dollar challenge in our company, something that was not Coke-specific, but that went across industries. So um, some of you might be sitting here in the crowd going, well, how does food fit into all of that? Um, something that Homey Dome has been able to do exceptionally well for us is um, we've not been able to get into some outlets. So a very simple example is a fitness studio um, or a gym, as many of you know. Um, many times, you know, people see Coca-Cola products, they say sparkling, sugary drinks, you shouldn't be in the outlet. But with Home Eat Home, we're now able to go to those outlets, um, offer them a healthy food proposition, and together with some of our waters or some of our other drinks, we're able now to activate that outlet. So that's in a nutshell how the accelerator came about. As we only have 50 minutes, we need to be quick. We thought, okay, to share all the experiences and anecdotes we had, um, you will not remember anything after the talk. So we need to have a framework. So usually when you think about a framework and you have a startup and a corporation, you think about the tanker and the speedboat, um, which was kind of boring. So we want to come up with something else. So um, as we were discussing, um, um, around the experiences we had, we always came up that we thought about two factors in play. And it's more like two forces in play. And then thinking about two forces and a framework, we watched too much Star Wars, I suppose, and we came up with that simple framework, which is the Earth and the Moon. So basically, um, imagine the Earth is a corporate. So it's big, heavy, <laughs> a lot of gravitation. Sorry, Mars. <laughs> And then on the other side, there's um, the aim of a unicorn. You probably are aware of the term unicorn, like multi or one billion um, startups like Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Like every startup want to be a unicorn. Um, and then there are different forces in between. So the first force is something that Marius just described, which is what we call synergies. So, um, sorry, you can't read it. It's synergies. Um, the reason for that is, um, if we want to get work together with a, like with a corporate, me as a startup, um, there's a reason we should work together with uh, Coke. Uh, so for example, Coke has like the biggest distribution network in the world. Um, if we can tap into that as a startup, that gives us a huge advantage because no other startup can use that, right? Same goes for the corporate. If the corporate is able to use the resources in other way with the startup, it creates a lot of synergies which make sense for the corporate as well. Right? So there's a force trying to create as much synergies as possible because of the various reasons, and that drives the startup close to the corporate. That's one fact. The problem with that is um, if you're getting too close, you kind of get swallowed by the corporate, which means that um, you're not becoming a startup anymore, but just a service provider. Because, and that's the other force, as a startup, you want to be creative, you want to do something new, otherwise you wouldn't be a startup. So we have that f force of disruptional innovation. So if you're not doing something different, you're not doing any innovation, so you're not a startup. That's very simplified, obviously, but um, that's the purpose of the framework. So we have these two different forces. Um, the corporate doesn't like too much the disruptional innovation force, because if it's too disruptional, it's kind of risky. Um, a corporate doesn't like risk too much. So if it's too far away, the corporate says, well, it's really risky and there are no synergies anymore. Why do you want to work together with us? And then it doesn't make sense to work together again, right? So what we thought, the perfect balance is in the middle and that's what we depict as 
um, a satellite. A satellite has a perfect balance of these two forces. If it's getting too close to the Earth, it will crash. If it's going too far away from the Earth, it will disappear into the universe. Nobody will see it again. But balancing these two factors is the key, in our opinion, of a corporate working together with a startup. So that's a very theoretical framework. To make that more practical, we want to share some of the yeah, lessons learned, I would say. Um, so let's go on. So we brought three highlights we want to share. Um, in these highlights, we want to quickly um, yeah, depict the different forces that were there to make it more prominent for you what it actually means with these two forces. So um, first highlight, um, that was the very first prototype that we did as Home Eat Home. Um, when we were thinking about like great idea, pickup stations, great food, blah, 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 um, we were thinking about, okay, we need to make an easy test and we can't test everything. So we were thinking about, okay, what do we really have to test? What's the big difference of Home Eat Home um, compared to all the others? And for us, it was location. So picking up the food on the way home, that location, that's like the trigger because then it's convenient, um, it's fresh, um, and so on. So we got rid of, of all that fancy visions we had about the technology part. We got rid of the product, we just bought existing stuff from competitors, and we just sold it down at the lobby at Coca-Cola to the employees on their way home. Um, that was the concierge prototype we did. In my opinion, that was the best way we could test the very initial idea, um, because we got a lot of good feedback. We moved on after that. What? Um, however, that, that prototype caused some problem. The problem was we were making money because we were selling the product. And why that was a problem, Mari is going to explain. So thanks for that. Yeah, um, as you can appreciate, it was quite funny when the team started and they came to me and said, "We have a big problem. We're making money." I go, "What?" <laughs> um, so the problem was um, just the way our company is set up here in Germany. We're es essentially a service company, and so we're just providing a marketing service. So the company is actually not allowed to generate any revenue. Um, so when the team came to us and said, well, we're generating revenue, I go, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's not a good situation. But as with everything, as with everything um, and this is one of the massive benefits that we have of working with the team, is um, we, we adapt it. Um, so we set up a structure where um, today they're outside of our company, they own their own entity, and good news, they can generate revenue. <laughs> so... so. Um, the second highlight, um, that's our very first station. Um, we did a lot of testing around that as well. And what struck us there was every time we presented the service to an interviewer or to a customer, the first question he or she asked was, well, when I open the door, I can take out everything and can fool you guys, right? And every single person was asking that question. So we were like, okay, we need to some, do something about it. So we were starting to think about, okay, huge technology improvement, like more having a locker system, which is cooled. Um, and then we have like pickup codes and um, like a huge technology thing. Um, it became quite complex. Um, we, for example, talked to the Parkstation of DRL. Um, you probably know that. They cost like around 100,000 euros to set up. So that wasn't the route to go. So we were thinking, what if we gave the impression that the customer can't actually fool us? So what we did is we teamed up with um, a startup in the US. They develop weight sensors. We put the weight sensors inside the fridge, put an electronic lock into the fridge so you can only open the fridge with your smartphone. And then we told the customers, well, you have the customer account, you open the door so we know that you are at the fridge with the weight sensors, we know what you take out. So if you take out more than you actually paid for, we're gonna charge you later on top. We never implemented that. <laughs> we just told that we are able to do that until two months ago. So two months ago, we actually implemented that. So during the first 11 months, uh, guess how many issues we had with fraud? One. <laughs> One guy tried to trick us and he was successful, but like after that we decided to, to move ahead. But what I want to say here now is um, it's not the technology that actually was helping us solving that problem. 
but it was just the communication. And that helped changing the user behavior already. So we didn't have to think about the technology solution here, saving a lot of uh, time and a lot of money on doing that, but focusing on something else. Um, another quite good thing about that example is you can directly see the synergy part because Coke is one of the big buyers of fridges, so they have very good rates on that, and we can tap into that. However, that also has a problem because we use Coke fridges for food, and Mari's going to explain again why. Just in the interest of time, um, yes, yeah, so uh, the guy started, bought the Coke fridges, and put the food in there, and I got a call that evening already saying, what are these guys doing? And, uh, what are you talking about? Well, they're putting food in a Coke fridge. Um, it's a big no-no. Um, so the team thought they were being very innovative. Um, our, can I say, CEO of our company at the time didn't think they were being um, too innovative. Um, so we had to change that. And luckily, you know, adapting very quickly, you know, that evening made some billboards, covered up all of the signs, and, you know, what you see is the end result today. So very quick to adopt and iterate. So um, the last one, we're going to make that short. Um, what we discovered in like the two previous examples as well, it's, it's all about managing expectations, and it's on both sides, actually. So um, briefly explain that last example. When we did the first test um, down at the lobby, we sent out in the morning an email to all the Coke employees announcing we're going to be downstairs. You're going to have a lot of food options down there. Just come visit. Um, an hour later, we got a call from um, the workers' council um, saying, guys, did you send that email to all the employees um, with an external email address? We were like, yeah, sure, we used MailChimp, like everybody, like every startup does. And they were like, you don't have the permission to do that. You would need to ask the permission because that's private data. You can't just put it up on a third party, right? And we were like, oh, okay, sorry. Um, and they were like, well, we can't permit to do you the test either now. We have to cancel that. We're like totally baffled. And then, and that's one of the key insights, I think, um, Marius's role, like Marius jumped again in there. Uh, Marius's role is, um, and that's very important, um, to actually manage um, the two different worlds. So he knows the corporate world very well. He knows the startup world very well. And he can translate. And that's what he's always doing for us. Um, so every time we run to a problem, he was translating so that we can actually communicate. And I think that's very crucial if you are a startup or a corporate working together with uh, one another. Um, you need to manage the expectations. You need to have like a common language that you know, not get lost in translation. And that's a perfect example again, because obviously we as a startup didn't follow the procedure and um, made a mistake basically without knowing that. And I think that happens a lot on both sides. And it's not so much the problem that these mistakes happen, but you need to find that common ground in order to um, make that happen only once, and then you learn from that. So just to sum up, because we're close to the 15 minutes, um, th three quick takeaways for you. First one is um, a successful co-creation, like working together, startup and corporate, it's about balancing these forces. So the synergy force, the disruptional force, it's about carefully balancing them. The second insight, the Coke model, as Maris explained, it's not an accelerator. It's working with people first and ideas second. The reason for that is if you do that, it's much easier to stay in balance for the first part. Um, and the third one is you need to have some intercultural training. Like if you're a corporate, you go to I don't know, Asia to Africa, you provide intercultural training to your employees, right? Um, there would be something similar if you work together with a startup. You need to have that common ground, you need to have that translator. Marius's role is a perfect example for that. You need to manage the organizational interface. There needs to be somebody who understands both worlds. Um, these are the key takeaways we want to provide. Thanks for listening. Thanks for coming that morning. <laughs>